Bill Ackman is here. He's CEO of Pershing Square Capital Management. The $11 billion plus investment fund has been instrumental in turning around some of the world's most powerful brands. Among them are Procter & Gamble and Burger King. But Ackman has also made some more controversial investments that have not turned out as well. He placed a $1 billion bet against Herbalife. He claims the nutritional supplements company is a pyramid scheme and wants the government to shut it down. He is currently involved in a struggle over the fate of J.C. Penney as the company's largest stockholder. He has been vocal about management changes he wants to see at the top. Today, he announced he is resigning from J.C. Penney's board of directors. I am pleased to have him here back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Let's just talk about J.C. Penney. Sure. So, uh, first of all, why did you become the biggest stockholder in J.C. Penney? What did you think you could do which you have not yet been able to do? Sure. Uh, so JCPenney is one of the great companies of uh, part of the, the, the history of America. It's been a struggle, really, for the, you know, it peaked perhaps in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, and it's been in decline since then. But because of its history, it has incredible assets. Uh, it owns, what are those assets? Those assets are real estate. Yeah. It's got 1,100 stores and a lot of very good locations around the country. It's got a great brand that's known by every American. Uh, you know, these are assets that are very difficult to replicate. Uh, and it has a revenue base of customers that uh, come to JCPenney. Um, the problem is that profits have declined and revenues have declined as you know, some combination of Walmart, Target, others have taken share. Now about management. I mean, here's what you did. I mean, you hired uh, Ron Johnson, who was in charge of the Apple retail stores mm -hmm. and had been instrumental in creating that whole very successful operation. Mm -hmm. And the judgment seems to be he did not only turn the company around, he made it worse. Understood. Uh, so the history here is actually... Uh, he was your guy. He's a guy that we believed in, uh, that we thought had a lot of great ideas, and frankly, I'm not the only guy on the board who believed in Ron Johnson. Uh, the board was very supportive of bringing in Ron as CEO of the company. So you know, what I, happened? What happened is uh, you took a brilliant guy with a lot of creative ideas, with a lot of terrific experience. I mean, Ron didn't just uh, do a great job at, uh, at Apple. He did a fabulous job at Target right. before that right. in Mervyn's. Right. So he knew something about retail. And he tried to make a lot of very dramatic changes to the company. Too uh, fast, too quick? Probably too fast, too quick. Uh, I think that uh, you know, it's, retail is a difficult business to begin with. I think that the customer takes time to understand how a business has changed. And uh, we also did it in the public eye, which draws you know, tremendous scrutiny and, and I think made it even more difficult. Do you believe that he could have made it if he had more time? I think his ideas are actually fundamentally correct, not all of them, but the big ideas. I mean, he's left us with the best looking stores we've had in many, many years. So uh, change the look of the stores? Look of the store, the shopping experience I think mm -hmm. is a better experience. I think there's some very good new brands that have come in. So a lot of positive change. I think the most negative change he made in the short term, which I think is right perhaps for the long term, is he took away the coupons, the discounting, right, right. and kind of the gaming right. that people have become accustomed Basically to. Basically tried to make the argument that we're going to give you good value all the time and don't be fooled by all the sales talk that exists in so many stores. Interestingly, people seem to be happier buying something at 50% off for $50 as opposed to having it marked at 40 uh, and, and there being no discount, which is sort of an interesting psychological phenomenon. But it's, it's real. Thing. Yeah, the second thing. So, so he's fired, and you replace him. He is replaced. Again, by... I want to be clear. So, I don't. We don't. I don't control J.C. Penney. I'm a no. large shareholder. I'm. I'm one member of the board. You're I have the largest told, stockholder. The largest right. stockholder. But that doesn't but give 17 me seventeen percent of the company. That's correct. But it doesn't give me the right to control the company. I'm just one board member on a board of today eleven directors. Up until uh, this morning, when I when I stepped off the no, we'll board. We'll get to that. All right. But before um, you did that, so I. Mean, I so, the, so the answer is we've uh, we had to make a change. Uh, we brought back uh, Mike Ullman, the previous CEO. Uh, Mike had uh, retired. Uh, Mike is in his uh, mid-60s. Uh, and we knew we had to bring in a long-term CEO, and Mike was brought in as an interim to stabilize the company, get a financing done, and I thought recruit a new CEO to help fix the business over the long term. Did, was that his understanding of what he was going to do? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so then you, know, you write a letter to him, or you write a letter to the board. Sure that you release, or it gets out, sure. saying that he should be replaced. I mean, people, this is Howard Schultz. Mike is working tirelessly to save the company, and it is despicable of Ackman to leak a letter asking for his removal. The irony is that Ackman himself has every step of the way severely damaged the company. I thought it was disgusting when I saw what happened on Thursday. I'm distraught. Sure. Bill Ackman has blood on his hands for being the one who brought Ron Johnson in. 
as someone who runs a public company, I'm speaking out on behalf of people whose livelihoods can be destroyed by people like this. That's pretty tough language. It's tough language. I mean, it's unfortunate. I've never spoken to Howard Schultz. I think he doesn't really understand the facts. He's a good friend of Mike Ullman, who sits on his board. Um, you know, the, the reality is uh, Howard Schultz, when uh, he brought in the new CEO, the board brought in Jim Donald to be the CEO of uh, Starbucks a number of years ago, and things were going poorly. Howard Schultz wrote a memo to the board that was leaked to the press. Uh, and it's not clear who leaked that memo yeah. to the press, but ultimately it led to the replacement of Jim Donald with Howard Schultz, and Howard yeah. Schultz, Howard Schultz returned to the company, but he turned it around when he came he, back. He did an absolutely fabulous job. And uh, But why did that memo end up being leaked to the press? Yeah. The answer is what my strategy is, what, my, what we do, is we use the public spotlight to ultimately put pressure on companies to do the right thing. Now, as a director, I've never before released a public letter to the press. I've been a very... I've been in the boardroom, I'm active. Outside the boardroom, I'm very quiet about what happens in companies. But JCPenney, over the last few months, made a number of decisions or didn't make certain decisions that we thought were important and critical. I worked within the confines of the boardroom to try to address uh, those concerns about a change in leadership. And when it was unsuccessful, I felt the right thing to do was to air my, my thoughts publicly, not by leaking a letter to the press, but by writing an open letter to right, the board. Right. What that does is it highlights the issues for the owners of the business. I'm a representative on the board of the owners of the business. The owners of the business don't actually know everything that's going on inside the company, and I wanted their feedback on what was necessary in order to fix the business. And by releasing a letter to the press that talked about concerns about succession issues, concerns about inventory management, concerns about cost controls, what I've achieved is I've focused the owners of the business and, frankly, the management and the board on these very, very important issues. And I think the message has been heard you know, loud and clear. Uh, and uh, then I negotiated a resolution so that we, you know, the only negative of doing that, of course, is you get a bit of a media circus. Yeah. That's not good for the company long term. And so within you know, 48 hours, we were able to come to a resolution that works, which is we're bringing on uh, two new directors to the board. Uh, with and you're getting off the board. And I'm getting off the board. I've achieved all that I can achieve on the board. Uh, I think we can restore some peace in the boardroom. Uh, but, you know, if you think about... But Mike stays. Uh, Mike is in as an interim, interim CEO. There is a search process underway. Uh, hopefully that search process will identify a good long-term CEO for the business. But if I may, if you think about boards of directors and how they normally operate, very often when there's a board member on the board that's not happy with decisions that are being made by the company, he or she might voice those concerns inside the boardroom. But if they're voted down, what they normally do is just step off very quietly. So if you think about the financial crisis, Let's say you were on the board of Lehman Brothers and you were unhappy with you know, the amount of leverage that was being used or some of the risks that were being taken. None of those board members went public with those concerns. They simply probably just resigned from the board. And I think the markets are better if directors are willing to take a stand and say, look, I'm concerned about steps the company is taking in its business. And that's what I did here. You want to be the champion of transparency? be the champion of shareholder. Uh, you know, I'm a representative of the shareholders. I want to be a champion of the company and the shareholders. And when I'm concerned about the direction of a business, I'm not afraid to air uh, those concerns. I'm a very straightforward person. I say precisely what I think. Sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. Look, well, more than that, though, I mean, you are a lightning rod. Uh, I mean, and you get engaged in all of these, uh, you know, public disputes with people. Dan Loeb, for example, Herbalife, we'll talk about that. Uh, Carl Icahn says, I'm telling you, he's like a crybaby in the schoolyard. I went, to, I went to tough school in Queens, you know, and they're used to beating up the little Jewish boys. He was like one of the little Jewish boys crying. Is this kind of language? Look, I don't control Carl Icahn. And I, the other thing I would say is if you look at our history over 10 years, I'm not used to getting into disputes with people. Actually, you know, we have been a very constructive shareholder of a you know, meaningful number of companies over the last 10 years. Most of this comes from a battle that I'm having with Herbalife. In the case of Herbalife, I'm not a shareholder pushing uh, to make a business more valuable. I'm, a, I'm an investor who's made a bet that the business will fail, uh, and I'm someone So you, you, you're short on we're sh Herbalife? We're short the stock, and what we are doing is we believe that Herbalife is operating a pyramid scheme. Yeah. We believe it's, uh, they're transferring wealth from a very large number of low-income, principally Hispanic uh, individuals in this country and around the, around the globe to a handful of wealthy people yeah, at the top of the pyramid. You think it's a moral outrage, don't you? It's, it's certainly a moral said, outrage, uh, and what we are doing is uh, catalyzing, again, a spotlight on the company so that the regulatory community, uh, you know, the SEC, the New York Attorney General, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, and FDA, apparently, uh, there's a story today in today's uh, Times online about a, a subpoena that had been received. Uh, but the bottom line is what we are doing here is we're highlighting problems at the company. Now, Carl Icahn is someone that years ago, uh, 10 years ago, I made a deal with that he 
um, ended up breaching a contract I had to sue him to perform, ultimately collecting after eight years. And so he's not happy with me making him pay money he was owed. And he's used this Herbalife investment as really a platform to, quote unquote, uh, get back at me. And he's had some other powerful allies that have joined in. Like? Uh, you know, Dan Loeb uh, took a, made an investment briefly and then so sold the stock. Thought, yeah, he thought the stock was going to go up. Correct. And, uh, or at and least he thought did. it was a good and trade. It, and it did. It did, absolutely. So he made a good investment. Sure. Sure. And See, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm longer term. I'm not a trader. What no. we do is we take large concentrated positions in generally very well-known companies, and we work with them for years. Uh, we took a stake in general growth in the middle of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stock at the time was 34 cents. We actually worked with the board to convince them to put the company into bankruptcy, which is kind of an unusual thing. We helped the company restructure its debts. We brought in new management. We recruited a new board of directors. I stepped off the board. We spun off a subsidiary called the Howard Hughes Corporation. That little 34 cent stock today is worth $34 uh, about five years after we made the investment. And the shareholders have made 100 times their money. Now, there aren't a lot of people upset with me about that particular situation because everyone wins. The problem with shorting stocks is that there are going to be some large number of people who own the stock who are not going to be happy, and they're, they're, uh, the CEO of the company is not mm -hmm. going to be happy with you. Well, you know that there are people also who accuse you. Uh, I mean, some people make smart investments in which they short a company because they believe the company intrinsically it, it has going to have earnings problems and mm -hmm. the stocks can go down and they'll look mm -hmm. like, you know, they'll look like the wisest of investors. Mm -hmm. There are others who believe that people invest and short and then go out to destroy the company themselves. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit on this? We don't go out to destroy companies. What we do, uh, and we short very few stocks. This is the second large short I've made in 10 years. The last one, uh, I've probably been sometime, uh, last time I was on your show, perhaps we talked right. about it. We were short a company called MBIA. Right. MBIA had a AAA rating from the credit rating agencies. It was a mortgage what? It had guaranteed uh, mortgages and other kinds of financial obligations and was creating a lot of risk in the financial system. And we shorted the stock and we disclosed publicly our concerns about the company's balance sheet and the risk it was creating for the capital markets. So the, the benefit of short sellers to the markets is they're sort of the canary in the coal mine. You know, right. they're the early warning signal about a problem at a business or a problem in the capital markets. You know, we've done, you know, we've probably spent, we've spent millions of dollars doing research on Herbalife, research that, you know, the government, frankly, on a speculative basis probably wouldn't do on a company like this. We've then provided all of our information to the SEC, the Federal Trade Commission, various state attorneys general, mm -hmm. helping them do their work, right? If, if Madoff had been a public company, we probably would have shorted it if we had done the work included it was a problem. And the benefit of that to the markets is that we can steer people away from uh, financial frauds and businesses which yeah. harm people. But, but do you respect Dan Loeb? Uh, the answer is I think he's had a good uh, track record. As an investor? Yes. But do you respect him? I mean, do you respect I'm disappointed with the way he handled the Herbalife situation. Why are you disappointed? Because um, he bought a stake in the company. Uh, he put out a letter saying how great a business it was. He set a target price in the in the 70s. Uh, and, and, and do you believe he believed in that or not? Well, he sold the stock a few weeks later. Um, so I, I, think the, I think if you're going to go out publicly, look, in Herbalife, we've gone out publicly saying the business is operating in a legal, a legal pyramid scheme. We believe they're violating the law. Here's well, our where research. Is, where is the government in all this? It's a very good question. Now, in the uh, story that came out in the New York Times today, it sounds like the government is looking into product quality issues at Herbalife. You know, our focus on Herbalife has been actually the money transfer elements of a pyramid scheme. But, you know, unfortunately, pyramid schemes don't care particularly much about the quality of the product they're selling to people. And the product they sell is a product that people consume. And there's a story in the New York Times uh, online, I think it'll be in tomorrow's paper, in the physical paper, which talks about uh, problems of metal contamination in the products, um, which can threaten people's health. And uh, so, again, I think... Uh, you know, short sellers are often viewed as the villains of the of the capital markets, but I think that uh, if actually the SEC followed around mm. the Jim Chanoses of the world, one right, of the right. very well-known short sellers, right. focused on what Jim thought was a problem, that would be a much more efficient way to yeah. get rid of fraud in the markets. A big invest in China there. Uh, I don't know, but yes. Why is this stock going up? Simply because Carl Icahn and others have been promoting it. That's why. Ultimately... Meaning that the people in the investment community is believing Carl Icahn more than they're be believing you. Sure, certainly on this investment, that's, that's the case. But simply what does that because say to you? It says very little. I and mean, I think, look, ultimately investors are, are, are only as good as their track records. If you were to look at our track record over the last 10 years, we have one of the best track records in the investment business, bar none, right? Yeah. That's a 10-year record. On Herbalife today, the market is saying we're wrong, but simply because in the short term, what the market tells you in the short term is what 
a certain subset of people believe. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're right. I mean, in MBIA, by the way, we were short for seven years before the stock went from 73 to 3. Uh, and there were what finally happened to cause it go to 3? Uh, the markets woke up. Really? So they finally and came around to your point of view and they and sold and therefore you came out a hero? Well, they started reporting rich. meaningful losses and uh, they had to uh, raise capital at very low, low prices. Okay. Uh, and that ultimately caused the stock price to go down. Now, so, in, the, in the short term, and Buffett talks about, or it's a famous expression, in the short term, the market is a, is a voting machine. People yeah, vote one way or another. Right, right. Long term, it's a weighing machine. Right, right. Weighing is much more That's precise. They call it value investing. That's right. You know, That's he, right. You know he's not looking at what the stock's going to be tomorrow and the next day looking at what it's going to be. Sure. You know, as, as whether it's a good company or not. It, is it a good value or not? Sure. Yeah. Let me just talk more about you. Because, I mean, what it is, I mean, you've been very successful. You started with... 50 million, it's now 11 billion. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good growth, I would suggest. Sure. Um, Target, another retailer. What happened there? What was the result there? Sure. Uh, so you're you're going you're going to not my greatest hits. You're focused on my worst no, hits. No, I, I want to go to your greatest <laughs> hits. No, you just mentioned one, the yeah. MIBA. Sure, but uh, that so was the greatest hit, wasn't it? What happened on that was one of the best investments we've ever made. Exactly. Sure. 30 million became whatever a billion, billion. It, and a half. Exactly. That's a pretty good deal for you. Terrific. So that's a hit. It's a hit. So I'm not just focusing on Sure. The answer with Target is we took a stake in the company. We admired the management. We liked right. the business. But we thought they had a large amount of exposure to the credit card, uh, to their right. customers. And you wanted them to eliminate that. That's right. And we approached them in the, I call it uh, the summer of 2007. And we said, look, fabulous business. Uh, your stock trades at a lower multiple than your peers because people are nervous about your credit card exposure. You can sell that credit card exposure to a handful of financial institutions. They will buy it from you. Mm -hmm. They will pay you fees for continuing to recruit customers. You can get out of the business of providing credit to your customers. You can take that $8 billion, reinvest it in your business. Your stock will go up. Uh, you'll have less risk in the company, and that will be a win. And that was a meeting that we had privately with the management of Target, and they seemed to love the idea. And uh, they asked us not to share our thinking publicly. And Ultimately, the company did not execute on our advice. The financial crisis hit. The stock went down from 55, where we had bought it, to at one point $25 uh, a share. Uh, and then uh, over time, the stock rose back you know, probably in the mid-70s today. And then I think in the last year or so, they finally got rid of their credit card uh, uh, assets. So you it was were, a case where the you company... Were long, you were long gone. We, we bought in the mid-50s. We exited in the mid-50s. Uh, not a great investment. We ended up losing a proxy contest. You know, one of the mechanisms by which we implement... Uh, our ideas, if we are unsuccessful uh, in convincing management, is by going to the shareholders. Do you worry, I mean this seriously, do you worry that you're getting an image that's not necessarily helpful? Yes, you know, of course. That Bill Ackman is in there like what they used to be called takeover artists, you know. He goes in and buys the company just so he can pump up the stock and then he's going to sell it and get rid of it. I mean, the image in that time, not reality. Let's talk about image. I mean, t look, talk about facts. If you look at every investment we've made since the beginning of time, active investments, we've made 26. Uh, 23 of the 26, I think, are best described as home runs, and I could walk through each of them if you'd like. Every investor has made a fortune, obviously, other than the people who were short the yeah. stocks on the other side of us. We've had a few disappointments. I think J.C. Point and Penny is a disappointment, obviously. Target was a disappointment. Uh, Target's worked, it worked it out was fine a for investors. It was a why. But, yeah. And then uh, and Borders. Uh, Borders, Borders was yeah. a passive investment, and actually management asked us to help when the business got into trouble. We did our best, but the, the, the winds of change uh, harmed us. You know, investing is not a business where every investment is profitable. Yeah. In fact, I would argue that our batting average is extremely high. If you were to talk to the shareholders of Canadian Pacific, uh, I think they, are, they would give you universal appreciation for what we were able to accomplish there. This is a company that had been uh, the worst-run railroad in North America for the last, you know, call it 10 mm -hmm. years. Uh, we st the stock was 46 at the time. Uh, we took uh, our investment in the company. We bought a 14% stake in the business. We ended up uh, replacing uh, management with a guy named Hunter Harrison, who's really yeah. the greatest railroader of all time. And it's becoming very quickly the best railroad in North America. The stock's tripled or almost tripled over the last uh, two years, and, uh, and everyone's happy. But we're not going to, not every investment we're going to make. Warren Buffett made a huge investment in railroads, too. Sure. Uh, Buffett, uh, the railroad business is one of the great businesses of the world. Why is that? Um, well, first of all, they're not going to build a new one. Right. If you own the second largest railroad in Canada, um, you know, this is an asset. That was what you, yeah. That's, that's Canadian Pacific. You know, it was an asset that was created 150 or 60 years ago, and you had to, you know, the government granted a bunch of land, and, you know, the, the, the replacement cost of the railroad is, you know, hundreds of billions and of dollars. And it's cheaper to ship by rail than it is by plane. That's right. It's more or efficient. It's, right. it's more efficient. It's better for the uh, environment. If you think about... Uh, 
the trucking, you know, shipping by a truck, you know, the taxpayer pays for the infrastructure, right? The, yeah. the roads Always. are taxpayer expense. In rail, the railroad pays for the infrastructure. The railroad pays for the rail and the ties. You know, so it's it's good for uh, you know governments running out of money. To it's good for efficiency. It's good for the economy. Now, look, I think uh, because we're so high profile, we're going to attract some critics. Um, when when you short a stock, you know there are yeah. a large number of people on the other side who don't like what you're doing. Certainly, the company is fighting back. Characterize yourself. Okay. Uh, you know, hear people saying he's the most optimistic guy. He believes he'll prevail. All of that. I've seen very few people in the world accomplish anything unless they were optimists. Right. Right. Pessimists don't get very much done. But I'm, you know, in the investing business, you need a high degree of confidence, but you also need a high degree of humbleness, and you have to balance those two. And where's the humbleness? The humbleness comes from mistakes. You know, J.C. Penney has been a big disappointment, and you learn from mistakes like that. Um, you know, uh, general growth has been an incredible success. You learn from, uh, so you, you need to do sufficient amount of research and homework. And we, when you place your bet that you have confidence, I mean, investing is a business where you can look very silly for a meaningful period of time before you're proven right. I looked very silly in MBIA and attracted a lot of scrutiny in the press. And did for, you ever doubt yourself? Uh, no, no. Did you ever doubt yourself in J.C. Penney? Sure. Big difference. What's the difference? The difference is, uh, it's kind of like Herbalife. It's a certainty that Herbalife is a pyramid scheme. That's a provable certainty. The doubt of that investment well, comes from... Well, it's such a provable certainty. Why haven't you been able to prove it? I, I think the answer is we don't have... A, uh, I think we have proven it. I think the market has not yet accepted our proof. And I think well, ultimately... That means you haven't proven it. If the market hasn't accepted it, you haven't proved it. I think the answer is that ultimately regulators will determine the fate of the company. Yeah. The government doesn't uh, complete its work overnight. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we will, I'm confident that we've, we've done our work correctly. Um, mm -hmm. But do, you do worry about the image issue. W worry is the wrong word. I mean, I, I think the, the answer is as long as I'm operating honestly, ethically, and doing the right thing, I feel very good about what I do. I mean, I think our strategy, right, if you think about a cap, the, the, the stock market, most of the investors in the stock market are passive, right? They're index funds, they're mutual funds, they're exchange-traded funds. Many investors are trade all the time. It's a very healthy thing for the market to have someone place a bet where they buy 10% of a company and where they are take a business that has underperformed for 10 years and bring in a CEO like Hunter Harrison and turn around a railroad. That's a great thing for the market, and it's a very healthy thing for the economy. You're about transactions. You know, you want to buy and then you want to sell and you want to make a huge profit. Now, we can. it may be you want to buy up to 10 years or 15 years, sell after 15 years, but it's a transactional thing. Rather than spending a whole lot of money uh, to really run a business and create a product and do all those kinds of things, you know the argument. Even Paul Volcker's made this argument. Too many people are going to Wall Street, too many smart people, mm -hmm. and, and working with you. And it's all about transactions, yeah, I, I don't not think... about building something. Well, let me, let, me, let me take a counter to that okay. in terms of what we do. So we're not about transactions at all. In fact, we do very few transactions, maybe one or two a year. Okay. We buy stakes I mean, in business. You're not a pure trader. We're not a trader at all. Investor. We don't trade. We buy yeah. a stake in a business. We get actively involved in the business. We work to make the business more valuable. And by the way, pretty much everything we've ever owned, with the exception of borders, has a higher value today than it did after we sold it which means that the impact that we've had on the business has been positive. Now, I'm also an, you know, an executive officer of a business. I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of a company called Howard Hughes. Right. This is a business that I created. It's a business I created by taking 34 assets outside of general growth, sticking them into a new company, recruiting a management team, right. building a board of directors, uh, and this company's doing marvelous things. So, for example, in, in New York City, we own the South Street Seaport. Uh, management team, again, I want to take credit for their work, but what they've accomplished is they've got approvals to do a new uh, they're going to completely transform the seaport. They're going to do a new, new development there. We're building uh, a new shopping center uh, in uh, in Las Vegas. We're changing kind of the landscape in Hawaii with a 60-acre development of 9 million square feet of, of real estate. So these are companies that are building and adding enormous value in the business. That would not have happened uh, were we not to have taken a stake in general growth and spun off that entity. What about Procter & Gamble? Uh, Procter & Gamble, a uh, great company. Uh, we've uh, 175 years of you know generally pretty fabulous successes. Mm -hmm. Great brand names. Great brand names. Uh, last four years have been very difficult for the company. Yeah. Uh, and you came in adamant to remove Bob McDonald. Uh, the, you know we thought it was time. He was CEO. And uh, by the way, was, he hadn't been there that long. He had been there about uh, four years. Okay, that's not and, a long time. Uh, he had been with the company obviously a long period of time. Yeah. And uh, you know the because most of the capital in the stock market is passive, 
Investors can't themselves make these kind of changes. Okay, so they rely on someone to take a lead, okay, yeah. which we did in Procter & Gamble. By the way, in Procter & Gamble, I worked very quietly with the lead director. We would speak periodically. It was only when we felt it was time that I made a public presentation about what I, the concerns were at P&G. And a couple of weeks later, Bob, I think, resigned of his own of his own doing. Now, that stock's gone, you know, it's up and 35%. And the former CEO's come back, one of the legendary names. And A.J. Laffley's a fabulous CEO, and uh, I think he's going to do a great job turning the business. He's also working on recruiting the next founder of the company. But as a, you know, I got enormous number of phone calls from Procter & Gamble alums uh, thanking us for the work that we did at, at P&G. And the same thing is true at, at General Growth. I mean, if you look at the Buxbaum family, had a $5 billion net worth going into mm -hmm. the the uh, financial crisis. That was down to $25 million when the uh, General Growth stock went from $63 to dollars a share to 20 or $0.30. Cents. We helped take it back to $34 a share. That's been a great thing, not just for a wealthy family, but for the, mm -hmm. the pension funds that own that stock, for the, you know, I get thank you notes from investors who've invested alongside us. So what's the drive for you? What's the motivation? Um, one, I think what we do is important. I think I'm making, you know, I do a lot of... So you're making companies stronger because you come in and you have a certain amount of power because you have a certain amount of investment and therefore you would like to say that if you look at your track record, you do much better in making companies stronger than you do in weakening companies in any way. That's absolutely true. I mean, I don't think anyone would ever accuse us of weakening a business. Now, J.C. Penney, not every investment is going to work out. You know, uh, there was more risk in J.C. Penney than pretty much every other investment we've made because of the nature of the changes so that were required. what was the attraction for you if there was more risk than anything else you've ever done? The, the potential for reward, right? I, and what's the reward? If you look at... What, the reward is simply how much money you make for you? No, look, I, I don't... keep score or what? No, I don't need more money. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not motivated by uh, financial returns. I, I'm motivated by one, I want to have a great uh, uh, track record. You know, if you look at Buffett, he's had a, whatever, a 60-year uh, track record. So I've got... Uh, I'm 20 years in, uh, but the record's been good so far. But, you know, I'd like to have one of the best track records What's in the business. What's the annual growth? I'm not allowed to comment on returns. Um, that's, a, that's an SEC restriction. But the um, you can look around there. I'll tell you, they're quite good. But what I like, you know, I've done a lot of philanthropic work over the last uh, uh, number of years. I actually think I make a much greater contribution through what I do you have. in the in my for-profit activities than I do in my not-for-profit well, And not activities. only that, you sign a giving pledge. That is true. Right. That is true. Um, this is very true. Meaning that you don't want to leave it to your children, you're going to leave it to half of it at least. Yes. Yeah, so charity. Well more than half. Yeah. Well more than half. Um, but but what's, I think what people forget uh, is, you know, Wall Street has, unfortunately, in the last, uh, f certainly since the crisis, gotten a pretty bad name. But Wall Street is responsible, for, is, is probably the biggest engine for job creation, you know, enabling businesses to access capital, enabling businesses to, to grow. I mean, you look at uh, Howard Hughes was a, a creation out of thin air. It's now a business that employs, you know, it's going to ultimately employ thousands of people, create a ton of jobs. Do you think the criticism of Mitt Romney during the campaign for his activities uh, in running a private equity firm went there? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, I think... Uh, good private equity investors create a lot more economic value than they destroy. And, uh, and, and grow more jobs than they save? They grow a ton of jobs. I think the biggest risk or with private equity... Save jobs that would be going away. The biggest problem with private equity is some, there are periods of time with private equity firms use too much leverage, which puts too much pressure on a business and, and risks a business's failure. Mm -hmm. Putting aside that, I think you know, the, the top private equity firms create a lot of mm -hmm. economic value. Too much leverage and too much was, was part of the problem of the economic recession we went through. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're not going to save the country with philanthropy, despite the fact I, you know, I'm philanthropic. I don't think that's going to solve our economic what issues. What will save the country? We'll save the country our good economic policies uh, that create the right incentives and a administration that's supportive of the business community. I think that's actually very, very important. And, uh, you know, policies that will make us competitive globally. You know, it's a, it's a global economy. Uh, you, there's a story today, I think, in today's journal about companies merging with uh, European businesses to move their operations offshore from a tax point of view. We have to have a tax policy that discourages that kind of activity. So you can bring the money home. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at the Is United States. Is that the States. idea? Have a tax policy so that the money can come home rather than leaving it offshore so you don't have to pay taxes on it? Yes. But I, I think if you, th you know, the United States is not dissimilar uh, to the kind of companies we invest in. We invest generally in very good companies that have lost their way. And with better management, enormous value can be created. If you look at Canadian Pacific, this was a dying That's railroad. That's one of your investments. It's a dying railroad under Hunter Harrison in a very short order. 
you know, less than you know, a year and a half, he's made dramatic changes to the business. The president is the CEO of this business that we call America. And the decisions he makes with respect to you know, in, you know, the way incentives are designed, the way he works with Congress as a, as a leader in effectuating uh, policy change can make an enormous difference in the growth rate of the country, in job creation, in happiness, in our safety. Um, I, think, I think that we, we can't diminish the importance of business and business practices. I mean, you look at what Bloomberg has accomplished as a mayor of, of, of New York City. He took uh, his for-profit mentality and uh, has applied it to a city and I think the city has accordingly thrived. I'd love to see the same thing happen for the country. It's tough management, too. Yeah. It, it, it's also he has the benefit of independence. Um, Financial independence. It's enormous benefit. So you're not obligated to anybody particularly. Very important. So we should only elect rich people? No, um, but we should. I think that there's a lot to be said uh, to have someone with uh, a business background making decisions about the economy. Just for just because I don't quite understand this, I mean, are hedge is hedge fund performance down? Uh, if you yes, if you look at the overall statistics, yes. And why is that? Uh, I mean, the it, answer is there. I think there are a lot more participants. Uh, I think that there have been. So it looked like it was it was just a a sweet place to be, and it's less sweet now. It's become a much greater percentage of the amount of capital that's invested, right. and the right. scale uh, by just the math makes it harder for that capital to grow. At, a high enough rate. I also think there's been some regulatory change that's made it harder for certain kinds of hedge funds to make money. You know, I think it used to be that, um, you know, people could, uh, uh, you, know, you hear of hedge funds that would just, you know, ask enough questions that they would get answers ahead of the market. I and mean, there's some, there was some bad behavior that took place and, and the government yeah, put in place. They've had some insider trading issues as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of the crackdown on that stuff has maybe taken away some of the bad returns from the, from the business. But I think the biggest driver has been uh, the, uh, the fact that the business has scaled. Um, but look, it's just like the mutual fund industry. As a collective, it, it's not a particularly attractive place to invest your money. But, if, but there are a few very good mutual fund managers who've done a lot better than the market over time. Same thing's true for hedge funds. Same thing's true for investors in real estate. Uh, if you weren't an investor, what would you be? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would do what I do now even if I weren't compensated uh, for doing it. Um, because I think it's a way for me to make the biggest contribution that I can make. I mean, I, I, look, I think about uh, government, if I, could, if I could effectuate change the same way I can effectuate change in the, in the private sector. But I think I can have more influence as a private participant than a, than a public participant. Thanks for coming. Sure. Lynn Ackman, back in a moment. Stay with us. Bill Ackman is here. He's CEO of Pershing Square Capital Management. The $11 billion plus investment fund has been instrumental in turning around some of the world's most powerful brands. Among them are Procter & Gamble and Burger King. But Ackman has also made some more controversial investments that have not turned out as well. He placed a $1 billion bet against Herbalife. He claims the nutritional supplements company is a pyramid scheme and wants the government to shut it down. He is currently involved in a struggle over the fate of J.C. Penney as the company's largest stockholder. He has been vocal about management changes he wants to see at the top. Today, he announced he is resigning from J.C. Penney's board of directors. I am pleased to have him here back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Let's just talk about J.C. Penney. Sure. So, uh, first of all, why did you become the biggest stockholder in J.C. Penney? What did you think you could do which you have not yet been able to do? Sure. Uh, so JCPenney is one of the great companies of uh, part of the, the, the history of America. It's been a struggle, really, for the, you know, it peaked perhaps in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, and it's been in decline since then. But because of its history, it has incredible assets. Uh, it owns, what are those assets? Those assets are real estate. Yeah. It's got 1,100 stores and a lot of very good locations around the country. It's got a great brand that's known by every American. Uh, you know, these are assets that are very difficult to replicate. Uh, and it has a revenue base of customers that uh, come to JCPenney. Um, the problem is that profits have declined and revenues have declined as you know, some combination of Walmart, Target, others have taken share. How about management? I mean, here's what you did. I mean, you hired uh, Ron Johnson, who was in charge of the Apple retail stores mm -hmm. and had been instrumental in creating that whole very successful operation. Mm -hmm. And the judgment seems to be he did not only turn the company around, he made it worse. Understood. Uh, so the history here is actually... Uh, he was, you're a guy. He's a guy that we believed in. 
uh, that we thought had a lot of great ideas. And frankly, I'm not the only guy on the board who believed in Ron Johnson. Uh, the board was very supportive of bringing in Ron as CEO of the company. So you know, what I, happened? What happened is uh, you took a brilliant guy with a lot of creative ideas, with a lot of terrific experience. I mean, Ron didn't just uh, do a great job at, uh, at Apple. He did a fabulous job at Target right. before that at Mervyn. Uh, with and you're getting off the board. And I'm getting off the board. I've achieved all that I can achieve on the board. Uh, I think we can restore some peace in the boardroom. Uh, but, you know, if you think about... But Mike stays. Uh, Mike is in as an interim, interim CEO. There is a search process underway. Uh, hopefully that search process will identify a good long-term CEO for the business. But if I may, if you think about boards of directors and how they normally operate, very often when there's a board member on the board that's not happy with decisions that are being made by the company, he or she might voice those concerns inside the boardroom. But if they're voted down, what they normally do is just step off very quietly. So if you think about the financial crisis, Let's say you were on the board of Lehman Brothers and you were unhappy with you know, the amount of leverage that was being used or some of the risks that were being taken. None of those board members went public with those concerns. They simply probably just resigned from the board. And I think the markets are better if directors are willing to take a stand and say, look, I'm concerned about steps the company is taking in its business. And that's what I did here. You want to be the champion of transparency? I want to be the champion of shareholder. Uh, you know, I'm a representative of the shareholders. I want to be a champion of the company and the shareholders. And when I'm concerned about the direction of a business, I'm not afraid to air uh, those concerns. I'm a very straightforward person. I say precisely what I think. Sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. Look, well, more than that, though, I mean, you are a lightning rod. Uh, I mean, and you get engaged in all of these, uh, you know, public disputes with people. Dan Loeb, for example, Herbalife will talk about that. Uh, Carl Icahn says, I'm telling you, he's like a crybaby in the schoolyard. I went, to, I went to tough school in Queens, you know, and they used to beating up the little Jewish boys. He was like one of the little Jewish boys crying. Is this kind of language? Look, I don't control Carl Icahn. And I, the other thing I would say is if you look at our history over 10 years, I'm not used to getting into disputes with people. Actually, you know, we have been a very constructive shareholder of a you know, meaningful number of companies over the last 10 years. Most of this comes from a battle that I'm having with Herbalife. In the case of Herbalife, I'm not a shareholder pushing uh, to make a business more valuable. I'm, a, I'm an investor who's made a bet that the business will fail, uh, and I'm someone so you, who's... So you, you're short on we're, Herbalife? We're short the stock, and what we are doing is we believe that Herbalife is operating a pyramid scheme. Yeah. We believe it's a, they're transferring wealth from a very large number of low-income, principally Hispanic uh, individuals in this country and around the, around the globe to a handful of wealthy people yeah, at the top of the pyramid. You think almost a moral outrage, don't you? It's, it's certainly you a moral said, outrage, uh, and what we are doing is uh, catalyzing, again, a spotlight on the company so that the regulatory community, uh, you know, the SEC, the New York Attorney General, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, and FDA, apparently, uh, there's a story today in today's uh, Times online about a, uh, subpoenas that have been received. Uh, but the bottom line is what we are doing here is we're highlighting problems at the company. Now, Carl Icahn is someone that years ago, uh, ten years ago, I made a deal with that he um, ended up breaching a contract I had to sue him to perform, ultimately collecting after eight years, and so he's not happy with me making him pay money he was owed, and he's used this Herbalife investment as really a platform to, quote-unquote, uh, get back at me, and he's had some other powerful allies that have joined in. Like? Uh, you know, Dan Loeb uh, took a, made an investment briefly and then but sold the stock. Thought, yeah, he thought the stock was going to go up. Correct, and, uh, or at least and he thought did, it was a good trade. It, and it did. It did, absolutely. So you made a good investment. Sure, sure. And See, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm longer term. I'm not a trader. What no. we do is we take large, concentrated positions, generally very well-known companies, and we work with them for years. Uh, we took a stake in general growth in the middle of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the stock at the time was 34 cents. We actually worked with the board to convince them to put the company into bankruptcy, which is kind of an unusual thing. We helped the company restructure its debts. We brought in new management. We recruited a new board of directors. I stepped off the board. We spun off a subsidiary called the Howard Hughes Corporation. That little 34 cent stock today is worth $34 uh, about five years after we made the investment. And the shareholders have made 100 times their money. Now, there aren't a lot of people upset with me about that particular situation because everyone wins. The problem with shorting stocks is that there are going to be some large number of people who own the stock who are not going to be happy, and they're, they're, uh, the CEO of the company is not mm -hmm. going to be happy with you. Well, you know that there are people also who accuse you uh, I mean, some people make smart investments in which they short a company because they believe the company intrinsically it, it has going to have earnings problems and mm -hmm. stocks can go down and they'll look mm -hmm. like, you know, they'll look like the wisest of investors. Mm -hmm. There are others who believe that people invest and short and then go out to destroy the company themselves. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit on this? 
We don't go out to destroy companies. What we do, uh, and we short very few stocks. This is the second large short I've made in 10 years. The last one um, to leak a letter asking for his removal. The irony is that Ackman himself has every step of the way severely damaged the company. I thought it was disgusting when I saw what happened on Thursday. I'm distraught. Sure. Bill Ackman has blood on his hands for being the one who brought Ron Johnson in. As someone who runs a public company, I'm speaking out on behalf of people whose livelihoods can be destroyed by people like this. That's pretty tough language. It's tough language. I mean, it's unfortunate. I've never spoken to Howard Schultz. I think he doesn't really understand the facts. He's a good friend of Mike Ullman, who sits on his board. Um, you know, the, the reality is uh, Howard Schultz, when uh, he brought in the new CEO, the board brought in Jim Donald to be the CEO of uh, Starbucks a number of years ago, and things were going poorly. Howard Schultz wrote a memo to the board that was leaked to the press. Uh, and it's not clear who leaked that memo yeah. to the press, but ultimately it led to the replacement of Jim Donald with Howard Schultz, and Howard yeah. Schultz Howard was returned to the company, but he turned it around when he came he, back. He did an absolutely fabulous job. And, uh, but why did that memo end up being leaked to the press? Yeah. The answer is what my strategy is, what, my, what we do is we use the public spotlight to ultimately put pressure on companies to do the right thing. Now, as a director, I've never before released a public letter to the press. I've been a very... I've been in the boardroom, I'm active. Outside the boardroom, I'm very quiet about what happens at companies. But JCPenney, over the last few months, made a number of decisions or didn't make certain decisions that we thought were important and critical. I worked within the confines of the boardroom to try to address uh, those concerns about a change in leadership. And when it was unsuccessful, I felt the right thing to do was to air my, my thoughts publicly, not by leaking a letter to the press, but by writing an open letter to right, the board. Right. What that does is it highlights the issues for the owners of the business. I'm a representative on the board of the owners of the business. The owners of the business don't actually know everything that's going on inside the company, and I wanted their feedback on what was necessary in order to fix the business. And by releasing a letter to the press that talked about concerns about succession issues, concerns about inventory management, concerns about cost controls, what I've achieved is I've focused the owners of the business and, frankly, the management and the board on these very, very important issues. And I think the message has been heard you know, loud and clear. Uh, and uh, then I negotiated a resolution so that we, you know, the only negative of doing that, of course, is you get a bit of a media circus. Yeah. That's not good for the company long term. And so within you know, 48 hours, we were able to come to a resolution that works, which is we're bringing on uh, two new directors to the board. So he knew something about retail. And he tried to make a lot of very dramatic changes to the company. Too uh, fast, too quick? Probably too fast, too quick. Uh, I think that uh, you know, retail is a difficult business to begin with. I think that the customer takes time to understand how a business has changed. And uh, we also did it in the public eye, which draws you know, tremendous scrutiny and, and I think made it even more difficult. Do you believe that he could have made it if he had more time? I think his ideas are actually fundamentally correct, not all of them, but the big ideas. I mean, he's left us with the best looking stores we've had in many, many years. So it changed uh, the look of the stores? Look of the store, the shopping experience I think mm -hmm. is a better experience. I think there's some very good new brands that have come in. So a lot of positive change. I think the most negative change he made in the short term, which I think is right perhaps for the long term, is he took away the coupons, the discounting, right, right. and kind of the gaming right. that people have become accustomed Basically, to. Basically tried to make the argument that we're going to give you good value all the time and don't be fooled by all the sales talk that exists in so many stores. Interestingly, people seem to be happier buying something at 50% off for $50 as opposed to having it marked at 40 uh, and, and there being no discount, which is sort of an interesting psychological phenomenon. But it's, it's real. Thing. Yeah, the second thing. So, so he's fired, and you replace him. He is replaced. Again, by I want to be clear. So, I don't. We don't. I don't control J.C. Penney. I'm a no. large shareholder. I'm. I'm one member of the board. You're I have the largest told, stockholder. The largest right. stockholder. But that doesn't but give 17 me. Seventeen percent of the company. That's correct. But it doesn't give me the right to control the company. I'm just one board member on a board of today eleven directors. Up until uh, this morning, when I when I stepped off no, the we'll board. We'll get to that. All right. But before um, you did that, so I. Mean, so, the, so the answer is we've uh, we had to make a change. Uh, we brought back uh, Mike Ullman, the previous CEO. Uh, Mike had uh, retired. Uh, Mike is in his uh, mid-60s. Uh, and we knew we had to bring in a long-term CEO, and Mike was brought in as an interim to stabilize the company, get a financing done, and I thought recruit a new CEO to help fix the business over the long term. Did, was that his understanding of what he was going to do? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so then you, know, you write a letter to him, or you write a letter to the board. Sure that you release, or it gets out, sure. saying that he should be replaced. I mean, people, this is Howard Schultz. Mike is working tirelessly to save the company, and it is despicable of acting.